Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started here in just a minute. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next installment of NACTA's virtual programming lineup. I'm Bob Vecchioni, NACTA's CEO, and I hope that you and your families are continuing to stay safe and healthy. We appreciate your unwavering passion and dedication to our industry during these challenging times. And today we are proud to bring you another timely session with education and professional development in mind. We have all been adjusting to the reality of handling our day-to-day -day operations remotely, but our panelists today have done something truly unique in that they have all been instrumental in conducting successful searches completely over virtual platforms. They're here to discuss the recent hiring process for two different positions, the Big West Commissioner and Utah State University's women basketball head coach, and how they were able to execute these hires without face-to-face -face meetings. First, we will hear from Dr. Jane Connolly, president of California State University, Long Beach, member institution of the Big West Conference. Dr. Connolly is entering her sixth year as president and amongst her many duties, was chair of the search committee for the Big West Commissioner. In addition, Jane serves on several journal, editorial and community service boards and is the author, co-author or editor of over 120 books, articles or book chapters. Next up will be John Hartwell, Vice President and Director of Athletics at Utah State University. John has been the AD Chair at Utah State since 2015. During his career, he has served on the NCA Division I Basketball Issues Committee, the Division I-A Board of Trustees Executive Committee, and the NCAA Division I Council. Our off-campus participants who added their expertise to this process were Jeff Schemmel, of College Sports Solutions and Dan Walters of Bufkin Baker. College Sports Solutions and Bufkin Baker strategically partner for executive search services, combining the college athletic expertise and experience of CSS with the higher education experience of Baker Bufkin. Jeff has over 25 years of intercollegiate athletics management experience and is a former AD who has served in key leadership positions within the NCAA, the Mountain West Conference, Conference USA, and at schools in the Big 12, Big 10, and Pac-12 conferences. Dan serves as an associate partner in Bufkin Baker's higher education sports practices. He is based out of their Winston-Salem, North Carolina office. He previously held the role of associate head men's golf coach at Wake Forest University. Before we begin the discussion, I would like to remind attendees to submit your questions using the Q&A function within the Zoom window, and they will be answered throughout the session. Thanks to all of our panelists for being here. We're looking forward to hearing your insight. Now, I will turn it over to Dr. Connolly to talk about her experience as chair of the search committee for the newly hired Big West Commissioner, Dan Burley. Well, thanks a lot, Bob. I'm glad to be here. Uh, you know, I'm, I am chair of the CEO group uh, of the Big West, and uh, I was told early in last semester, last fall semester 2019, Dennis uh, Farrell, longtime commissioner, let us know that he was planning to retire. Uh, but he wasn't announcing it in, you know, publicly until December. But we thought we still have a lot of time. And so we announced it in December. We sought RFPs for search consultants. We were able to partner with Dan and Jeff, as Bob's just 
described. And in our mind, this was going to be a face-to-face -face search. Well, that was by January, we had all of that in place. We were starting to get uh, names. And in February, um, the world changed. And so we pivoted very quickly to the notion that the so-called airport interviews would be virtual. And we use Zoom as our platform. Uh, there was uneasiness among the folks. So we started with maybe 40 plus people. Then we did 12 on a Zoom. Then we did five on a Zoom. And in each iteration, my sense was our search committee, which was great, um, got more and more comfortable uh, with the process. So we went 12, five, and then three. And by, by the time we got to three, uh, I think everybody felt like their input, they'd gotten the information they needed. I would say, um, you know, my chief of staff, uh, Neil Schnorr was fabulous in this and he helped monitor it. And if I had one um, monitor the Zoom calls, uh, if I had one bit of um, advice, uh, we, were, we had to really work with the committee to understand how to best use that platform. You know, we didn't let them, um, they, they just, they developed the questions we would ask, but we didn't allow them to do all the questioning because of the difficulty with that many people on a screen to know who wants to talk now. So it was, it was pretty highly monitored or managed. And uh, I think people got comfortable with that because they understood that's the way we got the most information uh, from the candidates. But we kept a high level of communication between me as chair and committee members and Jeff and Dan, lots of communication with committee members as well as I'm sure the candidates to prepare them for the experience. But for quite a while, we thought, well, we're going to do this in these um, preliminary steps. But when it comes down to the final three, we'll certainly have that person come and meet with the CEOs and members of the Big West uh, office. But at a, I think it was in April, uh, it suddenly occurred to uh, us, this is not going to work. You know, we had a deadline of May. We wanted to identify somebody by May. And we thought if we put it off, we might be putting it off till next September or October before There'd be easy travel and um, uh, you know face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, Dennis uh, and his right-hand person, uh, Rob Havka, were fabulous. They were willing to step in if we needed uh, kind of emergency backup, but we actually made the decision to have the final uh, interviews with all the presidents and chancellors virtually. And uh, they, uh, it was amazing. All 11 uh, participated and all 11 were quite pleased with the uh, interaction and the, uh, the the information they got. And of course, we were sending them lots of information kind of by email, so they had lots of background. So I just wanted to share that, you know, we, we reacted to the reality of the pandemic. Uh, we didn't do it all at once. We kind of had some iterations, but um, our group is extremely happy with the way it went, uh, certainly happy with the outcome of it. And uh, I think for many, they were surprisingly pleased uh, by the process. Uh, they were suspicious at first, but I think we were able to make it highly interactive and informative. So thanks, chance to talk about it. Thank you, President Connolly. Um, John, if you wanna take us through your search and how that went, um, kind of compare and contrast. Sure, thanks. So. So ours was similar to, to the commissioner search in that we knew that there was gonna be an opening early. We, our Jerry Finkbeiner, our previous head coach, uh, stepped down right before the start of the regular season back in November due to health reasons. Uh, so we had an interim coach throughout the year. And so the Mountain West tournament was actually a week earlier uh, this year than it normally is due to uh, hotel room challenges in Las Vegas, which uh, much to the pleasure of our men's team, that was a, a good thing because they got to win the, the Mountain West Championship. But as it relates to our women's team, so they lost on Monday, March the 2nd. So as soon as that happened, uh, we were full speed ahead. We had already, you know, engaged Jeff and Dan in the, in the process, had, had gone through kind of our criteria, what we were looking for. And uh, our intention was to start uh, interviews, in-person interviews the following week. So we got those scheduled. Uh, we had one interview, in-person interview scheduled in Salt Lake City on Wednesday, March the 11th. We had two more on the 12th. Uh, we were scheduled 
to go to Kansas City with Jeff to do some more interviews there uh, that weekend. And so uh, my deputy athletic director, and our senior women's administrator, Amy Crosby, were heavily involved in the process too. So we were in a hotel uh, early on Wednesday afternoon in Salt Lake City uh, doing the interviews. And obviously things were changing by the hour at that time. Um, the, the real uh, bomb, if you will, didn't hit until that evening. And it was ironic that we happened to be in Salt Lake City and, and uh, Dan was with us and, and we were having dinner and, and watching a television as we were eating dinner and the news breaks about Rudy Gobert, who ironically enough, a, a Utah jazz player, uh, and we're there in his hometown, although this broke when, when the jazz were in uh, uh, Oklahoma City. But so all of a sudden, you know, the world changed uh, as it relates to, to all of athletics uh, when that happened with Rudy Gobert and the, the domino effect thereafter. We already had a candidate who had, who had flown into Salt Lake City. Uh, so we had two more in-person uh, interviews on Thursday the 12th. But all the while, between interview, before the interviews, between interviews, hey, do we go to Kansas City? What do we do with that? Uh, so we made the decision after the third, for, again, this was the first round of interviews, after the third uh, in-person interview, uh, we decided to pull the plug and just say, hey, this is, uh, uh, this is going downhill quickly in terms of, of uh, infection rates and everything else and our ability to travel. And so we're going to have to shift on the fly on this. And, and I'll commend uh, Jeff and Dan and the job that they did in helping us have that flexibility to change. So as you fast forward it to, to the next uh, Monday and Tuesday, the 16th and 17th, we conducted six uh, WebEx meetings, interviews, if you will, uh, trying to stay consistent uh, with the questions that were asked in the format uh, for the three that we did in person. And we're, we're able to navigate our way through that successfully. Uh, we knew time was of the essence. And, and that's the other thing, uh, you know, maybe a little bit different than hiring a commissioner. Uh, when you have coaching turnover, uh, the threat of transfers and the, the anxiety of your student athletes hey, who's our next coach going to be? What's the style of play going to be? All of those things, uh, you know, with the student athletes in mind, uh, they were anxious. There was talk of, of some uh, entrance into the transfer portal, all of those things. So we, we didn't want to rush into a decision just to make a decision, but we did want to expedite it uh, and be as efficient as we could to make sure that we hired the right person. So uh, almost immediately after we finished uh, the final first round interviews on Tuesday, the 17th, um, we identified three candidates uh, as finalists and got on the phone that afternoon with them and said, hey, we, this is a crazy time, but we want to give you the option. Would you want to do your second round interview virtually? Are you comfortable uh, you know, flying into Salt Lake City and, and driving up to Logan and doing the interviews in person. Surprisingly, all three without hesitation said, hey, we still feel good about traveling. And, and we were actually able to conduct those interviews uh, on March 19, 20 and 21 uh, in person and then be able to extend an offer uh, that following Monday on the 23rd. Thank you, John. Um, Jeff and Dan, from your perspective um, in an advising role, how how were you able to kind of you know refocus so quickly? And for both of these searches, um, just talk about your perspective and, and your involvement. Well, I'll go first, and and then I'll let Dan uh, follow. Um, I think we knew uh, right away. In fact, uh, John described the the weekend uh, that we were planning to interview in Kansas City. I had actually arrived in Kansas City uh, when um, the announcement was made that that Big 12 tournament was was going to uh, uh, not happen. 
Uh, they had already had first round games the day before, actually. Uh, but so we uh, immediately, John and I and Dan, in our discussions, uh, decided let's let's do it virtually. So we knew uh, we had to um, adjust on the fly. The same was the case in the Big West search. Um, as Jane said, we had 12 initially identified candidates who we were going, we had scheduled them to be interviewed in LA, uh, all 12 of them uh, were gonna travel into LA to be interviewed in the initial round. So we obviously had to change that very quickly. Um, I think from, from my personal perspective, and I know Dan has thoughts too, is um, we knew we were probably blazing a new trail uh, with, especially with the Big West search, it was gonna be the first, I'm sure ever, uh, search from start to finish uh, for a division one commissioner that was uh, virtual all the way. And so uh, we did some things that um, we, we had to think through questions and answers. Uh, John talked about that to be consistent. Uh, we, as Jane said, uh, Neil Schnorr, uh, his, uh, he, her chief of staff was terrific in managing some of the process, uh, the actual interview process. Uh, and, and I think um, we did add one more round of interviews as a result of this uh, with the search committee. Uh, we just felt like um, the search committee could have, could do the initial 12 and then narrow it to another group and then interview that group again, and then recommend to the presidents uh, their final three. And as I said, we, we knew we were blazing new trails. So we had to be careful, we had to be thoughtful uh, we had to just um, think through every piece of the process, and uh, and I, I we're very proud of of the result. I think in both cases, Utah State and the Big West, we ended up with uh, the person that we would have uh, gotten had we done everything in person. So I, I think I think it was very successful. Yeah, I, I would I would echo uh, many of Jeff's thoughts. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, this business um, and really higher education in general is based upon communication. And um, we had a tremendous line of communication, not only with um, uh, John Hartwell and his staff, um, as well as Jerry and Amy, and then um, President Connolly and, and Neil Schnorr. So uh, the other CEOs that were involved in the Big West were, were tremendous as well. When there was those points of, hey, which way do we go here? Is it is it to the left? Is it a hard left? Is it a, is it a quick right? You know, there was many decisions being made on the fly. And the fact that we were all able to communicate, use platforms like Zoom, um, WebEx in Utah State's um, case, just made the process much easier. And frankly, it was uncharted territory for all of us. And then at the same time, I think we learned uh, multiple benefits um, from that uncharted territory. Uh, you know, a few of those being cost savings, um, you know, from travel, engaging candidates, different things. And then ultimately, I think probably most, uh, most apparent in the Big West, we were probably able to engage more candidates than we would have if we set up those uh, airport interviews in Los Angeles like originally planned. So um, it's been a, uh, a whirlwind the last eight, nine weeks for everybody that's connected to higher education. But there are some silver linings and, and ones that, uh, we'd love to continue to talk about in this discussion. Thank you so much for giving us that, that great overview. We have a lot of good questions coming in. So attendees, please continue sending those through the Q&A box on the bottom of your window. Um, the first question, what qualities of a candidate stood out to you, both good and bad in a virtual interview setting? Um, and how did that change maybe from in-person to virtual or what were you looking for specifically? Jane, if you wanna take it first, you can. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a, you know, a quality that um, every great leader has to uh, exhibit is uh, nimbleness and problem solving and staying unflappable in the face of um, difficulty. And although in general, I would say almost 99% of the time we, we were lucky, we did not have technical problems. There were occasional, you know, freeze ups, but they would only last a few seconds. But in one case, uh, our candidate was completely knocked off his um, 
uh, Zoom call. And I don't know what happened. I'm not smart enough to understand the cyberspace there. But he got back on and continued to answer the question that had just been posed to him without without missing a beat, although he'd been off for probably 30 seconds. And I remember thinking uh, that somebody who can navigate this virtual environment and stay calm and stay in a problem solving mode, um, you know, it might have uh, given us a chance to see something about him we wouldn't have known uh, otherwise. Uh, you know, some, some obviously in my mind, some of the uh, candidates were better at understanding where they should put the camera and what kind of lighting they should have. That didn't seem too important to me. Um, I think most people's passion and their um, intellect and their grasp of the big complicated world of collegiate athletics were able to shine through. And by the way, that was uh, the person who did that so well was the person we eventually hired, Dan Butterly. So, uh, you know, ma managing the virtual environment might be a good predictor of being hired. You know, I think it was uh, Jeff who said, you know, communication skills are, are really, really important. And I think uh, people's communication skills uh, maybe come through even better virtually than they do uh, in person, because you may not get to see the body language around it, but you can clearly understand uh, their communication uh, skills along with Subject knowledge is, is very key too, and, and those shine through in, in the virtual interviews. And, and just as Jane said, uh, and, and there's no, no better example of this in the last six or eight weeks, there, there is no CEO 101 or AD 101 that tells you to how to navigate uh, the challenges that we're going through right now, but, but you've got to stay true to your core values and, and you've got to be able to communicate and you've got to have flexibility. You, you can't get rattled by change because we are in a constant environment of change right now. And I think all of those uh, clearly come through on, on a virtual interview. And I would add just the thought, um, I think in answer to that basic question, I think you still look for the very same things that you look for in an in-person in interview. Um, is, there, is there strong leadership? Uh, do they have, have they done their homework? Um, do they know uh, what they're talking about uh, relative to the job at hand? So those kind of things uh, you look for very, um, very closely. I think uh, one of the things that was a little bit different uh, that we saw was, uh, and Dan and I used to communicate while it was going on about this, but um, all, almost every case there was uh, a request for an introductory statement by the candidate. And uh, some of those uh, were um, scripted, well, were, were read. I mean, we could tell they were reading that. And, uh, and, and again, I think, um, some of those, uh, you do get a good idea of how good they are uh, on their feet, how, how good they are um, just in, uh, in that kind of a situation without, um, without being led very strongly. So, and Dan, I, I think you and I talked about that during the interviews. Yeah, I think we were, we were texting back and forth a little bit during them and saying, um, you know, we got another reader here or whatnot, right? But I would add to that and, you know, ultimately, um, you know, interviewing one-on-one, I mean, you've got to be yourself, right? And so uh, conveying who you are, knowing who you are um, is extremely important. And, and why? Well, because that's the person that your, your new employer, your new inter, you know, institution, the folks that you're going to serve, um, that's what they're going to get, right? And so you don't want this to be um, acting, you want to be yourself. And um, that's no different than in person, virtually, or whatnot. But but stay true to who you are, know who you are, and, and then secondly, know all the other people that are on on the screen virtually slash you know if it is in person, know who they are. That's uh, that's very important when you can create that personal connection. Um, ultimately, the conversation flows better. The dialogue um, continues to to get deeper and, and you can really learn more about the institution you're interviewing for. And of course, those folks can learn a, uh, a lot more about you. 
Hey, Dana, one, one other comment I would say, and, and this is about controlling the environment you can. And, and Jane mentioned Dan getting kicked off uh, uh, his interview and, and being able to reconnect. Those are things that nobody can control. But I would say, you know, make, make sure you're professional and how you go about the interview. You know, uh, put yourself uh, in a quiet, if you don't have a home office, put yourself somewhere quiet where the dog's not running through barking, you know, kids aren't coming through screaming, uh, you know, make sure that you're prepared and, and again, control those things you can control about the environment. This question probably um, all four of you can contribute to as well, but how did you feel that the importance of references changed since conducting virtual interviews instead of in person? I didn't um, feel uh, that it changed. Uh, maybe I'm missing something uh, profound here, but uh, uh, we were very interested in the people who were supporting uh, the candidates and the information that they shared. So. Others might see a nuance, but I didn't see that. A good question. I'm one of those types of people. It's it's great to see the references that somebody puts down on a page, but you know that the references they put down, they're going to give them glowing marks. Uh, I'm more uh, I'm a connect the dots guy, and probably uh, lends itself to how many years I've been in this business. But uh, you know, making sure hey, I want to see the stops where those individuals have been. Who are people in my inner circle who I absolutely trust uh, without a doubt who may have either been in contact with them or, or have people in their inner circle who have? And, and so uh, I don't know that it makes a significant difference. So, um, I lost John there for a minute at the end. I assume maybe he's finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Our technology. You guys have anything to add on that references? Yeah, I, I would echo uh, what John just said. I, I think from our perspective, Dan's and mine, um, I think the fact that we did this virtually from start to finish, particularly with the Big West, um, put some pressure on us to make sure that references were checked and and we quite frankly we talk about this all the time uh would echo what john just said is i've been in this business so long now that um it's uh, it's easy for me to connect those dots and call the people that they've worked with that might not necessarily be references and, and that's how we do uh, a lot of our background checks anyway uh, and i think it especially when we got to the end of the search when you have 12 presidents on a Zoom call uh, and, and they're asking you questions about the candidates and their backgrounds and their references, uh, I think we as a search firm consultant have to be very good and very thorough. Yeah, I, I would agree, Jeff. I, I think from the search consultant's perspective, um, because there's not that um, personal interaction, you know, some of the face-to-face -face that, that we would traditionally get, um, you do feel a heightened awareness to, to dive into not only the references that are presented, but, but the off the book references. And uh, obviously that's very much part of our job to connect those dots, as John mentioned, behind the scenes. And then to maybe even go a layer or two deeper, just to make sure everything is lined up for, uh, for the search to be completed successfully and, um, and for frankly, the client to be, uh, to be pleased with the results. Okay, going off of that references question, um, John probably has a good answer to this too, if he can get back with us. But um, for these searches, was there was a community forum considered um, like it may have been in person? And if so, uh, how was that process vetted? Uh, John looks a little frozen. So I'll just say that we did not, um, e even when we were, uh, planning the in-person um, uh, version, I, I don't think we had a community forum um, as part of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll jump in here. Thank you, Jane. Um, the, um, we have had outside of our athletics work on the higher education side, 
you know, recently we have, uh, we've been fortunate to close out multiple searches here within this past week and even this past month. And, and some of those searches have had uh, community forums. Um, your tr traditional higher ed search will have that, especially when you're talking to Dean, a vice president, chancellor, chancellor, whatnot. And so um, it is still very much possible to do that in a virtual setting. Um, it definitely feels different. Um, it takes on a little bit different shape and size, but at the same time, um, this technology is wonderful to engage uh, a, uh, a large group of people. So um, you definitely have to make sure your settings and your um, and everything is correct on the front end with uh, with whomever you're using as that technology platform and make sure you have the correct licenses. But from there, you can enjoy, in, engage a large set just like we're doing right now. Um, there's no reason that it cannot be a community forum and and questions can be asked and and you can really dive deep from a from a campus perspective with candidates. So more specifically um, for campus searches, um, you know, when you're able to bring people to campus, you can showcase your facilities in person, you can walk through, you can, you know, meet people face to face as you're walking by. How do you showcase the, the work environment and the campus setting during a virtual interview? Well, uh, there's John. John's back. Did you hear the question, John? Probably a good one for you. I, I did not, but go ahead and, and again, controlling those things you can control. Sorry, I had to change locations. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll uh, answer it quickly, uh, but it's a question about, you know, with a virtual interview, how do you show off your, your campus and your facilities and, and all the stuff that will typically come with an in-person interview? Um, and, and I think uh, you were lucky enough to, uh, to actually have some candidates come at the end uh, for the Big West, our plan was to have es especially those finalists uh, come to the conference office and, uh, and, and meet staff and that sort of thing. So we, we could not do that. Um, but I think what, what we do, number one, is uh, it's important for us to educate the candidates, number one, especially as a search firm consultant. And then, um, quite frankly, it, it helps us determine who the good candidates are if they do their homework uh, and they uh, they're familiar with uh, the staff that's in the conference office or uh, where it's located and and that sort of thing so i think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword but i, I think uh, certainly a good question uh, especially from a campus perspective john yeah and i think it's a great example of the importance of doing an introductory guide. I mean, whether it's for women's basketball or any position that you have, putting together a nice document, obviously a lot of that information is gonna transfer, whether it's a women's basketball, an associate AD, any of those things that talk about the campus in general or you know the athletics facilities or the community and tailor it to you know, in, in the case of women's basketball, uh, talk about the returnees, talk about the APR, talk about all of those types of things that are that are important to that specific job. But I think that's always helpful uh, to provide to, to candidates for a position. Yeah, John, I'll just um, piggyback on that. The, the document that your team made I'm sure you're referring to, and, and of course you remember what was very comprehensive. I wanna say it was 30, 40 pages, but it really worked through the roster and all those different things that become extremely important to, uh, to potential coaching candidates. I think the, um, the commissioner side of things is a little bit different where a lot of that information is attainable. And then at the same time, you're really trying to dive into to multiple campuses and understand um, you know, some of those dynamics of, um, of that culture in and around the conference. Um, on, on top of that, one thing that, that kind of comes to mind as well is some of the questions that are asked by the interviewee are just as important as the questions that are asked by the committee and, and whomever is conducting that interview, right? And so having some probing questions that can, that can lead to some further thought and for that a candidate who's in the quote unquote hot seat at that point in time to maybe get a better feel for things that, that they couldn't on their own, um, you know, investigative kind of due diligence uh, on the front end.
This question um, is for John and President Connolly again. Um, how did you prepare to introduce Dan Butterly and Kayla Ard to the Big West ADs and the Utah State women's basketball players? And what, if anything, was done differently since you couldn't get together immediately in person? Uh, well, of course, this is my first ever uh, big uh, commissioner uh, search. But uh, in fact, uh, after the decision was made, especially my chief of staff, Neil, worked closely with Jeff and Dan and also the Big West uh, uh, public information officer. Um, and they, they created a whole template and iterative uh, uh, set of interviews and uh, publicity uh, that went out nationally, uh, but of course uh, was directed toward uh, the rest of the ADs. We also, um, as soon as the search was completed and we had a signed contract, we immediately started pushing out information about Dan. Um, to the CEOs, the ADs, the SWAs, the FARs, you know, everybody, the student athletes. Uh, something that struck me, and this might just have been uh, about the Big West search, uh, uh, the, the athletics in the United States is very big, but it's a kind of a small village as well. People really know each other. Uh, and uh, so uh, there was a lot of jubilation. As I didn't even know the word was out yet, and people were interacting. But uh, more to your point, we really spent quite a bit of planning time and production time on getting um, lots of information about uh, Dan, but also interviews that were sent out. So I was very impressed by that. Yeah, and I, I would say in our case, as it relates to the student athletes, as soon as uh, we, we had finalized Kayla as our head coach, we set up a virtual meeting with all of our returning players uh, while she was on campus interviewing she did get a chance to meet a couple of our, they just happened to be where they were graduating uh, seniors who, who were on campus. But as, as it relates to introducing her to our fan base, to, to all the Utah State community, uh, we did a virtual press conference, which I think was very well attended. Um, we, and, and streamed it live uh, on Facebook and, and that uh, received great response. And, and, you know, I, I will say whether it's the, the press conference components, whether it's the virtual interviews, I think when we do get to that new normal, whatever that may look like, I, I think you're going to continue to see some of these things utilized uh, when we get back to that new normal, as, as people talked about from a cost cutting perspective and a, and a more efficient way of doing things and being able to include more people on the interview processes. I, I just think there are some things that we're learning out of necessity right now uh, that, that will be carried forward as we uh, move into the future. Can and I might to... add just one comment there, Dana, if I could. I think John uh, and Jane are both right. It is, um, as I said earlier, we, we were blazing a new trail. And, uh, and I think what we found out uh, as we continued to evolve through the processes was that we, um, we could do this successfully. We could get to where we wanted to go uh, this way. And I know uh, we conservatively estimated that doing everything virtually in the Big West probably saved the conference thirty to $50,000 in expense uh, relative to the search. And, uh, and, and that is very meaningful. Uh, and I think the future will, um, will help us there. I think we all believe in-person is still great and, and probably better. Well, it certainly is better. But um, I think, especially at different stages of searches, um, this, this may become a norm. As we look forward to, you know, possibly using this for more different types of positions and on different campuses, um, how would you say, or, or what suggestions would you have for engaging candidates um, families, you know, their children, their spouses, their partners, um, as usually as you get down the line for those on campus visits are kind of typically engaged somehow. Do you think that goes away or is there a way to incorporate them into the process as well? You know, I, 
know, I think that's a great point because because certainly uh, those individuals who are looking at potential job opportunities, it, it's not an individual decision. It's a family decision oftentimes. And the comfort level of a spouse or a partner or kids uh, for a not only an institution, but the community surrounding it is very important oftentimes. But I do think, again, uh, there are virtual opportunities uh, for those folks to become familiar with the campus or with the community uh, without physically being there. It's not a substitute by any means, but it certainly uh, at least gives them some, some knowledge uh, to, to be able to learn about an area. I'd say uh, just add not about searches per se, but this whole crisis has uh, moved our campus to really uh, increase our virtual, uh, you know, virtual campus visits. You know, we're an urban campus. We 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 mainly serve our area, our California area, uh, so people would come in person to campus, but you know now they can't. So now we have a much uh, classier virtual uh, campus visit, and which wouldn't have happened had we. Um, uh, had this not happened to us. Dana, yeah, well, I mean, I'd kind of second what John says real quickly. Um, you know, I think of kind of when uh, when a coach gets to campus and is, is doing that final interview, maybe um, his partner is or her partner is working with uh, a real estate agent or trying to find more out about schools in town and things like that, right? Education opportunities for their children. And frankly, all that can be done in a virtual setting, as John noted, right? I mean, um, I'm sure those varying um, industries and, and, and kind of subsets have, have had to go virtual in, in many different capacities. And we've all experienced that outside of this, uh, you know, college athletics realm. So um, I think all that's possible, but it kind of starts from what we talked about from the very beginning, you know, being creative, being thoughtful, being adaptable uh, throughout this process and not only serving um, your client and the folks that you're working for from a search consulting perspective, perspective but also understanding that position the candidate is, is in and, and how important that is and making them feel comfortable to make the best decision, not only for themselves, but for their family as well. And I would add one comment to Dan's. I, I do think that this is creating um, uh, an opportunity, but an obligation uh, for firms like Dan's and mine uh, to do our do we're, we're adding another step to what we do uh, another service to what we do and whether that's to um, get as much information to the candidates about the campus or the community uh, that may very well fall on our shoulders as well in the future Did you get any sort of feedback from the candidates themselves obviously the ones that you eventually hired but um, just any, any sort of advice or, or tips for, for future searches to be conducted this way based on the, how the experience was on the candidate side of things? Maybe I'll go first, uh, probably a search firm question because we probably have contact with more of the candidates post-interview than um, either Jane or John might, but um, I do think we've touched on many of it already. Uh, I, I think um, having a good setting behind you, uh, making sure that um, you're in a comfortable position to uh, conduct an interview uh, without distraction. Uh, I think the same, um, same important issues are uh, vital to the interview process. Uh, know, your, know your subject matter. Um, have your own philosophy and be able to express that philosophy as you go forward. But I think a lot of that is very much the same. Okay. And kind of taking that in a little bit of a different, um, different way. I don't think we had really any specific or overall negative feedback from candidates, right? Obviously this pandemic is what it is, right? It's, it's what we're dealing with day in and day out. And we've got to figure out the best way to handle our business we can um, and continue to push forward. I would say that, um, you know, overall, the search, really the, the nuts and bolts, the, the blocking, 
the same, right? It's just a matter of there's these varying nuances and varying things that are going to pop up. And I think candidates have been very understanding of that. Um, and, and most importantly, from a search perspective, getting a candidate the most information possible on the front end that the client is comfortable with is extremely important, right? So they have obviously all their login credentials from a virtual setting, but, but all the varying information that they can have and become um, most comfortable with, with uh, what they're about to take on from an interview perspective is really important. So that, that information on the front end is paramount. We touched on this, you know, a little bit um, looking into the future. Obviously, we, we, we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks and months. But when when hiring freezes are lifted um, and we're able to return to some kind of new normal, do we see this virtual setting going away completely or using more of a hybrid or just sticking with what works and with that cost savings that you guys talked about? I mean, that's huge. How do you see it working when we can get back together again? Well, I would um, just jump in to say, given the um, already announced $398 million um, uh, cut to my system, the California State University system, the 23 campuses, I think uh, presidents and uh, who, are, are, who are gonna be filling essential spots, they know they have, even though we have a hiring slowdown, they're gonna be looking for ways um, to cut costs because we're just we're we're going to be cut between six and ten percent. So just to Jeff and Dan's earlier points, I think search firms who can come with that package that we could save you fifty thousand um, dollars by doing this that will be very attractive because we won't be making many hires, but we always have to hire people in, in key positions. So I would see it remaining um, at least in the foreseeable future uh, from my perspective as a president. I would absolutely agree. I just think virtual interviews are, are going to be part of our new normal going forward. I would add, I think, um, you know, my prediction would be, and I've talked to multiple colleagues regarding this, is that a lot of the beginning parts of the search and even up into the middle and, and, and venturing towards the end of a search, will a lot of that can be done virtually and be done virtually very, very well. Maybe when you get to the finalist stage and folks want to see campus and you really want to um, um, meet that person, you maybe try to figure out a way to uh, to meet them in person. But um, at the end of the day, I think we've we've unfortunately had to to um, you know venture into this world based upon you know this pandemic. But we've found some some very much some some silver lining and some and some things that can that can help not only be more efficient, cost save. And, and possibly do an overall better job moving forward. A couple of thoughts from me, um, echoing what's already been said. Uh, shoot, we're doing a Zoom technology today, but how much better will it be tomorrow? And, uh, and, and I think the technology is especially uh, the impetus for technology companies now to make these kinds of forums even better um, is out there. Uh, and, and I think from Dan's and my perspective, we have already started our self-analysis of how did, what could we have done a little better from a search firm perspective, uh, whether it's uh, the process or whether it's um, the conduct of the interviews or uh, any of the related issues. So I think all of us um, are going to get better at this. We already are, I think, getting better at this uh, Every day, we're learning how to do this better. So I, I think it, it is part of our future, and, and we'll make it better. Hey, Dana, if I can interject one other thing, and this relates to this question and a previous one, too. But, you know, obviously, different people have different styles, and, and you hear different strategies for interviews. But one of the things that people always talk about is, whether or not to have handouts to give, you know, if, if you're interviewing for a position, do I bring a handout with me to the interview? Do I send the information? Um, a lot of times people say, well, handouts are really distracting and you're better off, you know, going mano a mano, if you will, in the interview process, letting your communication skills show themselves, and then maybe as a supplement afterwards to, to provide the lead behind. These virtual interviews, 
you know, it, it would be really awkward in a virtual interview to say, hey, if you can reference page four of the information I sent you. So I, I think as it relates to virtual interviews, it, it really antiquates uh, some of those leave behind materials and, and maybe they're still good as a, as a follow up. Uh, but uh, I think it does, uh, again, goes back to having very good communication skills. And John, uh, talking about that reminds me, we did have uh, in one of the interviews of Big West, um, a person that did want to share a document and that and it it didn't work um so uh it, it it probably didn't help that candidate much uh to to have the glitch in the system that he or she sh could not share the document he wanted to share i think we all would agree that probably um the the leave behind or the the pamphlet on the front end never really gets anyone um the quote unquote job but um it can create an impression good or bad, right? Um, but at the end of the day, it's about how you can communicate your vision for the opportunity at hand, um, you know, with your obviously words and, and, and your energy and, and all the different things that you show at that time, you know, and w when that time has been afforded you. Those are all great points. And I think it's important because, you know, we do have a lot of people who are on the hiring side on this call today, um, but we also have a lot of job seekers too that are interested in, in what you guys have to say um, and how the process went for the candidates that that went through it. So, um, you know, we focused a lot, obviously our discussions today were based off of division one experiences, but I think a lot of the excellent points that you're making can be applied to um, institutions of all divisions. Would you agree? Is there any kind of position that you think this couldn't work for? From a virtual standpoint, I, we're talking a lot, you know, about the high level positions, but do you see campuses instituting this, you know, from the GA level to the mid manager, you know, all the way up? Does that make the most sense? Well, I'll go first here uh, for sure, Dana. Uh, this is this is uh, our future, I think now. And, and we talk about whether it's division two II or three or, or even NAI, I think, um, some of our colleagues uh, are, are using, are going to use this technology in a greater way because uh, the cost savings, and John and Jane know this as well as anyone right now, um, it's everyone is tightening their belts. Everyone is trying to figure out how to make things work the way they used to work with less finances. So um, I think it's going to cover uh, all the divisions and certainly from a search from uh, a division one commissioner all the way down to um, uh, whatever position in, a, in an athletic department or a university. Yeah, and I, I would echo that saying, and I can think back to multiple times, uh, probably at my last three stops where uh, football coaches would say, hey, I want to fly a couple of candidates in for a GA's position. I mean, I can tell you that's, at least at Utah State, that's out the window now. You, you can do that virtually. And I, I, I'd, go, I'd go further and down into to other divisions where maybe simply there was just uh, phone interviews taking place in the past. I think this is an opportunity to engage those candidates even further. And that may have been happening at the Division One level as well, where you know, let's hop on the phone with X candidate or Y candidate or Z candidate. Well, now, you know, let, let's be a little bit more formal. Let's uh, do the virtual um, interview, you know, have the video and all that. And you may even find more things than you did previously when it was just simply a phone interview or some of those initial conversations. I, you know, I, I want to echo uh, that notion. Um, uh, in, the, in a sense, we had, we had student athletes on our search committee and they were so comfortable um, in this format. And so especially for positions that are not kind of the highest level where you're gonna be in a different age group, I think we'll find some of our candidates for these kind of more junior positions to be quite you know, comfortable and effective uh, in the format. They've spent most of their life on a FaceTime or a, a face chat or something else. So I, I would imagine it, we get even better information from it as time goes on.
All right, we have just a couple minutes. Um, I have one more question. It's a little bit outside the box. Um, do you think there would ever be a consideration for having more than one candidate on at the same time for sort of like a debate style session? Um, you know, similar to the political world, kind of kind of thinking along those lines. Would there ever be a need for that? Do you think? I the first thing that comes to mind to me is confidentiality, and, and again, probably the the higher the level the position, the the more important confidentiality is and and that would certainly be a challenge there at least those two if they were going head to head in a type of debate uh, that would cause it but th that would certainly be an interesting dynamic and yes <laughs> that is an outside the box uh, thought yeah and I, from my perspective um, I suspect that that might happen in the future we were asked a question earlier about, um, did you have a community, uh, university community interview session, a very public session? Um, and, and some of us have been through those kinds of things in the past. And so um, there may be an opportunity there uh, where uh, much like this, with this many participants, um, you do something publicly and, and it, it, it might, I could envision where you might have two candidates going at the same time. Well, thanks, thanks everyone for, for being with us. I, we have a couple minutes left. If there's any closing statements that you wanna leave our attendees with today. I'd say good luck in all your searches. And uh, I, I think I'm, I'm quite taken by Jeff's comment earlier. This uh, platform, we're using Zoom. There are others that they're, they're gonna keep getting better because this is big business now for these companies. And, um, you know, I, I grew up being a Star Trek fan. And so I'm, I'm waiting for the hologram to appear in front of me. And so I, I have, I'm very optimistic about um, this approach. So thank you for including me on the panel. Yes, I would just echo what Jane said. You know, uh, this is a, an uncharted, these are uncharted times that we continue to go through. Hopefully uh, the optimism of some of the potential treatments uh, and vaccines over the course of the last week, uh, that, that trend continues. But, but flexibility, agility, patience, you know, that's, uh, my staff probably gets tired of me saying that because I say the same thing to my staff uh, and coaches that I do to my kids. Hey, you know, everybody is going through this. Exercise, patience, be kind, because we're all in this together. And, uh, you know, the ability to, to get through to the other side, we're going to be stronger uh, on the backside of this thing. And I would echo uh, what both have said. I do think um, that we, ha we have blazed and we will continue to blaze new trails here. And it's going to continue. Uh, the pandemic is going to be over at some point in time. We don't know when that's going to be, but the things we've learned through this um, time in our history uh, is going to help us in the future uh, post pandemic. And I think uh, the lessons we learned, we better put to good use and, uh, and, and use those in a way uh, post pandemic that benefits all of us. I think all, all those are, are tremendous points. I, I, would, I would go back to, to something we talked about earlier and just say, communicate, communicate, communicate. And you know, frankly, that is why uh, President Connolly and Athletic Director Hartwell are, were, were so great to work with um, throughout you know, the month of March and April. Um, we got thrown curveballs and sliders and knuckleballs and all kinds of different things um, throughout the process. And, and we were communicating in all kinds of different ways. One time it'd be an email, then it'd be a text. Obviously we were on this virtual forum, but um, the, you know, the consistent communication that we had throughout the process ultimately got us to a better place. And it wasn't just with both of them who led the communication, but, but their counterparts and as well as their staffs. Um, they were great to work with and our, uh, you know, our work a little easier or, or, or a little bit more efficient, but, um, but they were great partners and uh, it takes a village. There's no question about that. So um, appreciate them very much for taking this time too. They have busy schedules. 
as well as you, Dana, uh, helping throughout this process. And thanks very much, Bob, for, uh, for having Jeff and I on today. Thank you again to all of our panelists for your communication. Thank you for being part of our village. And we appreciate all of our attendees who were able to join us today. And we look forward to seeing you online again soon. Thanks. Stay safe, everyone.